the blood comes into the brain from two sources, an anterior source and a posterior source. So there's an anterior circulation and a posterior circulation. All of this comes in at the base of the brain. Nothing comes in from the top. It all comes in from the base. So the anterior circulation derives from the internal carotids. There's a common carotid here that is going to divide into the internal carotids that's going to go into the cranium and an external carotid that's going to supply blood to your face and oral cavity. The posterior circulation derives from primarily the vertebral arteries. These are, are large arteries, uh, so the vertebral arteries, and also a little bit from the uh, what's called the anterior spinal artery. So what I've done is I've put the anterior circulation in red, the posterior circulation in blue. It's sort of anybody's uh, call as to whether this the, the, the boundary zone, which is the posterior cerebral artery, is part of the anterior or the posterior. Realistically, it's, it's the division. So the anterior circulation comes from the internal carotids. The posterior circulation comes primarily from the vertebral arteries. What's very interesting about this arrangement is that there is a circle of vessels. And this circle of vessels is called the circle of Willis. There are several vessels, blood vessels, that make up the circle of Willis. So here's the internal carotid. It comes in and it divides into the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. The anterior cerebral artery on either side is joined by what's called the anterior communicating artery. So now we've gotten from here all the way over to here. Now there are two posterior communicating arteries that join the middle cerebral artery or the internal carotid to the posterior cerebral artery that is the final division of the posterior circulation. So here you have this circle. Here is the internal carotid. It divides into the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery. The anterior cerebral artery on either side joins up. The uh, middle cerebral artery joins through this posterior communicating artery to the posterior cerebral artery and around you go. A different view of this is seen in the next slide. This is a dissection where the entire vasculature, uh, anterior and posterior cerebral, uh, anterior and posterior cerebral uh, circulations has been dissected off of the brain. This is a dissection that is uh, present in the Museum of Comparative Anatomy and Paleontology in Paris. And what you can see is this is anterior, this is posterior. Here are the vertebrals. Here, uh, here are the two internal carotids. The carotid comes in. It divides into the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery, and the anterior cerebral artery. The two anterior cerebral arteries are joined right here by the anterior communicating artery. The, this anterior uh, portion is then joined by this uh, posterior communicating artery to the two posterior cerebral arteries. What's the, there are two things that we should remember about the circle of Willis. Number one, at its best, it will allow you to lose uh, in uh, cerebral blood flow in one of these components and be saved by the rest. So for example, one internal carotid could block up and you'd still get uh, blood from the other side. The second thing to remember is that these, that the circle of Willis is, is incredibly uh, variable across individuals. So not everyone has a complete circle. And some people have variations. Some people have a really large posterior communicating. Some people have a really small posterior communicating. In some people, the anterior communicating is, it, there are two of them. So there are a lot of variations on this theme. But when it's working well, it provides you a backup plan if there's one blockage or, or not even a complete blockage, but 
less blood coming in at one point, it can be made up from the rest of the circle. All right. So let's go through, we're going to learn the critical blood vessels. These are blood vessels that you have to know, even if you're not going to become a neurologist or a radiologist or a, uh, I should say a neuroradiologist or a um, neurosurgeon. You have to know these just to pass the boards. It's, I think it's an important um, piece of neurobiology to learn. All right, so here are the vertebral arteries. Here's the anterior spinal artery that divides and joins each of the vertebral arteries. At the junction between the medulla and the pons, this verte these vertebral arteries join to become the basilar artery that comes that starts at the pons and goes right down the center of the pons and midbrain. There are three uh, paired arteries that come off of the posterior circulation. One is pica, posterior inferior cellar, cerebellar artery. That comes off of the vertebral arteries, typically. And another one is ica, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Then there is the superior cerebellar artery. And finally, the basilar splits in to the two posterior cerebral arteries. So what do these different uh, vessels uh, provide? Where do these different vessels provide blood to? Well, pretty much whatever their name is. So for example, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, pica, typically called pica. So posterior pica gives blood to the back underside of the cerebellum. And then ica, anterior inferior cerebellar artery, gives blood to the anterior underside of the cerebellum. And as you may su suspect, the superior cerebellar artery gives blood to the convexity of the cerebellum. Along the way, they also provide blood to the lateral portions of the brainstem, and we'll look at that. In the anterior circulation, so, so these, uh, these three paired uh, blood vessels are providing blood to the brainstem, to the medulla, pons, and midbrain. The posterior cerebral artery is providing blood to the occipital lobe, primarily the occipital lobe, the underside of the temporal lobe, and a few other places that we'll look at. The middle cer cerebral artery is going to provide blood to the most of the convexity of the brain, including critically the uh, the um, uh, the somatomotor strips, okay? Motor cortex, somatosensory cortex. And the anterior cerebral artery is going to provide blood to the medial surface of each hemisphere. So this shows you that, uh, this shows you the distribution. Uh, I, I, I suspect this is pretty hard to see even when we zero in on this, but let's just take a, a typical section. Let's take the pons. The, here's a section through the pons. The middle part of the pons gets its blood from the basilar. The basilar travels right here. It just gives blood up to this middle portion of the pons. And then at the pons, the, the, at the level of the pons, what you have is ica, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So the lateral portion of the pons is getting input from ica. And then the convexity of the cerebellum gets input from the superior cerebellar artery. Uh, we want to look at also, um, and the case is similar for the others, but we're now going to look at more closely, we're going to look at what happens uh, with pica. So we're going to take a closer look at pica. It provides uh, blood to the, uh, to the lateral part of the medulla. Now, the medial part of the medulla is getting its input from its blood supply from uh, the basal, I'm sorry, from the anterior spinal artery, and then the inferior olives are getting its, their blood supply from the vertebral arteries, and everything else is getting its, its uh, blood supply from pica. So now let's think about what's, uh, what's present over here. Uh, one thing that's present over there is the spinothalamic tract. So that's going to block out 
if we lose that blood supply, we will no longer be able to feel pain and temperature from the opposite side of the body. Another thing that's over here is the uh, spinal trigeminal nucleus. So pain and temperature from the ipsilateral face. So that combination of pain and temperature from the ipsilateral face and the contralateral body is very uh, uh, diagnostic of, this, uh, of, of a problem with this uh, pica circulation. And we'll come back to that when we talk about strokes. So now let's move forward to the anterior circulation. It, this is an angiogram. What has happened is that there's been dye, there's been a contrast dye put into one internal carotid, and pictures are taken uh, immediately after another moment and after another moment. And this is the, um, this is a sagittal plane, so the front and the back, front and back, front and back. And this is a coronal plane, um, left, middle, right. And what you can see is that immediately after putting in the dye, it, this dye reaches the entire medial to lateral part of, of the cerebral hemisphere in the front all the way back to the back, but not including the occipital cortex. I don't know if you can see this, but this back end area is not, uh, does not receive blood from the internal carotid. That's going to receive blood from the posterior cerebral arteries that get their uh, first flush of blood from the vertebral arteries. All right, so a moment later, this blood has entered into, uh, the, the, is being collected into venules. And then finally, it's being collected into, uh, it, it, into sinuses. And it's only when it gets to this late venous stage that you see that there is a contrast seen on the contralateral side. So despite the presence of the circle of Willis in a normal individual, the, uh, the, the blood supply is, is, is localized so that the left carotid is perfusing the left hemisphere and the right carotid is perfusing the right hemisphere. When we look at the uh, distributions of the anterior circulation, what parts of the uh, nervous system they, uh, they provide blood to, we see a couple of, of interesting features. This is looking at the side of the brain. Here's the back, here's the front. And this blue area here is what receives blood supply from the middle cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery gives the uh, blood supply to most of the convexity of the brain. The yellow area here is coming from the anterior cerebral artery. Now, most of what the anterior cerebral artery is doing is the, is the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere, but a little bit peeks over onto the convexity. The important point here is to see that there is an overlap between the territory of the middle cerebral and the territory of the anterior cerebral. This is called a watershed zone. And so there's an advantage and a disadvantage to this. The advantage is that if there's an interruption of uh, blood flow to this watershed zone from the middle cerebral artery side, the anterior cerebral artery side can cover for it and vice versa. That's great. So there's a plan B. There's also a downside. What's the downside? This is the last piece of, of tissue, of brain, that is supplied by these blood vessels. So the pressure is, is decreasing as we get there. And when we get to the watershed zone, we're at the very end of it. So if consider a person who has low blood pressure, well, they may not actually get to the watershed zone. So in a person who has hypotension, they may lose function in this watershed zone. And indeed, that, that is the case. And we'll look at that when we look more at some stroke syndromes. The opposite of a watershed zone is an end zone. And this, that's not shown here, but for example, as the middle cerebral makes its way across, and it does, it comes in through between the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, as it makes its way across, it sends up blood vessels into the depths of the brain, into where the, the basal ganglia, the, the striatum, the pallidum, the internal capsule 
are located, the thalamus. And if these blood vessels, these blood vessels are single coverage, there's no backup plan. So if they go down, what happens is that that, that piece of tissue is not, is not going to get blood supply, not now, not ever. And so it's an, it's end zone. These are, um, it, when there's a, uh, when there's a block there, you lose that piece of tissue and you, it's called a lacuna. It's a small little spot where you've just lost uh, function. These are lacunar strokes. And it's very, it's a very typical appearance in a person with, with uh, a, a history of hypertension. So they, these, the little blood vessels blow, that piece of brain is gonna die. Okay, so now we're gonna go into looking at the di various different types of strokes.